Uh, thank you for joining us. Hope you all had a good lunch uh, and you are enjoying the sun coming out. Um, maybe that provides a little good news uh, for this afternoon. Lord knows we could all use it today. <laughs> yeah. uh, so um, we're here today to talk about, um, I, I think, a really interesting and important issue. Um, one of the most lasting impacts of the pandemic and of that we've all experienced is, of course, the central role that technology has played in just about every aspect of our lives. We know that we are all doing our meetings on Zoom, our kids are doing school by, you know, whatever platform. Um, but probably the most central and more, most consequential um, uh, uh, change when it comes to technology and, um, and its uses in a remote environment is around access to care. So doctor appointments by Zoom became very commonplace. I'm sure many of you have experienced that. Tests and devices used to diagnose and monitor diseases at home became incredibly essential. But with that also, access to and fluency with mobile devices as a precondition to care became, took really center stage. So in theory, the notion that we have, that we can connect uh, via, have our healthcare uh, and we can monitor our healthcare and take care of our healthcare needs remotely um, means that communities that would otherwise be hard to reach are more accessible. In theory, it should make healthcare more equitable. But it's not as easy as that, as we all know. Issues around education, issues around trust, issues around access to connectivity and devices, as I mentioned, can become barriers to care as well. So how do we sort of size up this moment, take a look at what we've learned in the last, gosh, two and a half years, and uh, improve outcomes? So that's what we're here to talk about today. And we have an amazing panel. So um, from first on my left, uh, Dr. Sonak Pastakia is professor with Purdue University Center for Health, Equity, and Innovation. Uh, he was until quite recently, until the pandemic, right, um, based in Kenya and India, focused on community-centered care, and now bringing learnings from those models to urban and rural communities in Indiana to address barriers related to populations at risk. Uh, next, we have uh, Lisa Ehrenhauer. She is Executive Vice President of Medical Devices at Abbott. That is a $14 billion business that advances technologies to address some of the most widespread, expensive, and hard to manage chronic conditions, including uh, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, chronic pain. Uh, prior to Abbott, Lisa held executive positions at Intersect ENT, Boston Scientific and Guidant. And then finally, uh, Chuck Henderson. He is CEO of the American Diabetes Association, uh, where you have been, you joined just prior to the pandemic. Right, I think it. January 2020. Yeah, <laughs> I, when I started my job too, a very auspicious time to begin new work. Um, but he has spent uh, the 24 plus years prior to that in both the for-profit sectors and volunteering in the not-profit sectors related to health, most recently with the Champion Life Safety Solutions where he was CEO and president. So um, I have just a couple of, of disclosures. This, um, this panel is sponsored by Abbott. Um, they were the, also the first anchor sponsor of the American Diabetes Association's Health Equity Now, which is an ongoing initiative designed to address health disparities for people with diabetes. Abbott has committed $5 million over three years to the program. We'll talk a little bit about that program um, and the partnership during our discussion. In addition, since 2006, Abbott and the Abbott Fund have invested uh, nearly $6 million to support uh, Sunak's Empaths Diabetes Program in Kenya, which he will share more about. Abbott has donated products worth $4, uh, four million plus to the program and has also engaged Sonak as a consultant to help build health access in India um, for SIWA, the largest trade union of women in the world. Both Chuck and Sonak's flights and hotels were paid for by Abbott, uh, by Abbott sorry, uh, but they're not being compensated for their time on this panel. Sorry, we like to get all those disclosures um, out there so that you understand um, the independence of the remarks from our, um, from our uh, panelists. Okay, so let's, uh, now that we've gone past all of that, let's get into it. So I want to start by asking you all, what is it, what are the gaps to healthcare? We know a lot of the opportunities that you were able to take advantage of to provide healthcare during the pandemic. But over the course of these 
you know, those two years, what gaps did the pandemic reveal in the healthcare system? And, and I will ask this, um, you know, to Lisa and Chuck, but Sonak, I also want to hear what you have to say with regard to your um, experience in both India and Kenya. So, Lisa, I'll start with you. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, um, and thank you all for uh, joining us for this important discussion. So, as I think about the pandemic, it's there's no question um, there are disparities in care, and I think the pandemic just brought those brought those out um, um, in you know certainly a very challenging time and I think it's it's such an important topic as we think about health equity moving forward what can we do about those disparities and so um, really um, you know as, as we think about um, the, t the time and the learnings and the gaps you know it's just I even just think about just for people with chronic diseases. So during the pandemic, you said you were doing meetings on Zoom, and sometimes I did healthcare on on Zoom, right? And but sometimes I actually just skipped my healthcare. I skipped some of the preventative things. I'm sure some of you did as well. Um, but I think about in particular real gaps for people with chronic diseases who can't take two and a half years off in managing their care. So as people with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, in fact, those two conditions and, and chronic conditions broadly represent 70% of deaths today globally. Mm. And so two and a half years is literally a lifetime for people. And so as I think about the gaps, a lot of it comes in not just the kind of acute episodic preventative care, but it's also more broadly um, chronic care. Um, so I think that's a real, real opportunity as we think about the learnings moving forward. Chuck, curious about your perspectives. Yeah, and I would say, you know, to your point, Lisa, I mean, just the overall disparities, especially for people living with, with diabetes. I mean, 40% of uh, folks that uh, died from COVID diagnosis had diabetes. 60% uh, of people of color are more, are more likely to get diabetes over the last couple years than anybody. And so when we think about it from an ADA perspective, we have to do something about it now, which is why we launched Health Equity Now, um, but not not just that, we have to, you know, we've, we've been treating symptoms, putting a Band-Aid on things. We really need to get down to, to the ground rotter. So when I think about a lake and a stream, if the lake gets tainted, the fish die, we take the fish out, we treat the lake, but we don't treat the actual root cause. And so for us, you know, that was really, really eye-opening that, uh, that the systems are broken because the systems really weren't set up for underserved folks in the markets. And so uh, we really need to fix the problem and not just fix a symptom. And that became more apparent during the pandemic? And how did you see that manifest itself? Well, I mean, it, it, it manifests itself with, uh, with uh, people rationing their insulin. Um, you know, we have a 1-800 hotline. You know, people were, were calling asking for supplies, um, you know, asking for insurance. Um, you know, they were laid off. They couldn't afford care. Um, they couldn't get in to see their doctors for a year. And so, you know, they reached out to the ADA. Obviously, you know, we're a leading advocate, a leading global advocate, and so we can give them advice. We can uh, give them direction, but they're really suffering. Sunak. Yeah, and, and if any of you are like me, I'm sure the pandemic was a time of reflection. And so as I looked around at the health system, I looked at all these things, what really became clear is that the, in the world of the pandemic, everything just shrunk. And all these proactive things that we were doing to address inequities, they kind of just slipped to the wayside. Um, and everybody, everybody became reactive and just concentrated on the things they prioritized. And it's through this reflection that it really became clear that we didn't prioritize a lot of the low-income populations. We didn't prioritize rural populations. And so a lot of the care gaps that were really manifesting were a result of this shrinkage and this prioritization. And so to me, the pandemic told me a lot about the broader way that we approach the world. Uh, and so I think what we really have to do is address these broader ideological, psychological issues where we don't prioritize those populations. We might give it lip service, but when push comes to shove and there's a, a pandemic and a crisis, all those things just kind of slipped to the wayside. And, and as Chuck mentioned, if you look at the morbidity and mortality from COVID, it was those populations that we didn't prioritize that faced the, the largest gap. And so, you know, just kind of piggybacking on Chuck's comment, I, I don't think we can address these direct issues unless we address this broader issue. And I saw this in Kenya as well, where rural populations really struggled with getting access to care. They couldn't transport. They couldn't take the public transportation there. All of these challenges were tenfold greater for low-income and rural populations. What I'm hearing all of you say is that not only the new, the new challenges that that pandemic brought, but also exacerbating long-standing. You know, it's long-standing. I think yeah. that's what, like, for me, it was like, aha! Why weren't we? 
this is an emergency. I mean, it's literally a healthcare emergency that I don't think we, we weren't. I'll just say, I'll, I'll take away the I don't think. We were not addressing adequately as a society. So yeah. I think it's a real call to action for all of us. So that would be a bit of a silver lining of the pandemic, yeah. right? It, it brought a lot of awareness on places yeah. where we have a lot of cracks. Yeah, and, and, and I would also add, you know, if you look at the speed at which we came up with these wonderful COVID therapies, you know, we actually, you know, broke down a lot of the bureaucracy, a lot of the politics, you know, Republican, Democrat, I mean, all that went out the window. I mean, we literally thought the world was going to come to an end. And so, and, and, and so we, we bypassed some of those traditional paths of, like, politics to actually get to a good therapy. And so we should approach that, right. you know, whether it be diabetes or whatever chronic disease. Right. It can be done. We yes. saw it can yes. be done. Sorry, yeah. yeah, and even just another way to think about this is we've accrued all these debts over these decades of negligence to the, towards these populations. And the disproportionate toll was basically the bill collectors coming to come collect. And it, I, I'll be honest, it was an incredibly depressing time for me to see colleagues that I've worked with, patients that I've treated for years, just very quietly pass away from a pandemic. And so, you know, I, I think if there's anything we learn from a pandemic, it's that we have to put a spotlight on these issues and actually address them and not accrue further debts. Okay, so Lisa used the word call to action. So let's talk about what those, what those actions are. Talk a little bit about what, so now that you, you know, this was an eye-opening event, we saw the existence of longstanding problems, new problems that the pandemic have introduced. What are you, what are you each doing about it in your, in your capacities? Yeah, and I think, and I obviously represent the side of innovation, um, and I'll, I'll just give you one example that we did actually during the pandemic, and that is with regards to COVID testing, right? And so I think when we first, all the first uh, COVID tests were introduced in early 2020, they were all lab-based, right? They were all, what we all know now is called PCR. Who knew about all the different yeah, yeah. kinds of tests, <laughs> right? We've all become experts because yeah. we've had to. Um, and so we recognized very early on that that wasn't going to be submitted sufficient and it was clear it wasn't sufficient right lines around the corner it could take you know days to get a covid test you know issues with transportation all those kinds of things were were causing issues and so we said cash at abbott we're going to need to be able to mass produce testing that everyone can use and that they don't have to wait 24 hours 48 hours i think earlier on i think my first pcr test was like a five-day wait yeah mm -hmm unacceptable, right? And so that's what we did with our antigen tests, which are now widely available around the globe, pan bio outside of the U.S., by next now in the U.S., is trying to uh, design products really for access and affordability into, into our innovation. And so, you know, very simple, easy to use. You know, you look at the materials, relatively inexpensive, and ability to mass produce so we can get that out there. So that was just one example. And as I think about my innovation moving forward, it's all about thinking about access and affordability early on um, versus, versus sort of waiting until the end and saying, gosh, it's just not impacting as many people as we, we could and should. I have to say, the first time I experienced like, wait, I can take this COVID test mm -hmm by myself at home and get a result right then, it felt like a miracle. So uh, Abbott is not paying me to say this, but my <laughs> next, yeah. next now was just like, it yeah. just felt like a, just a, like a miraculous. Yeah, and so, it's uh, helping us all live our best lives yeah, now, yeah, right? Yeah. Because, you know, as it turns out, you know, two and a half years later, last time I checked, COVID is still very much around, yeah, right? And I yeah. think it will be and important yeah. for us to have those tools in our hands. And you can say the same things about, yeah. you know, antivirals and vaccines, yeah. and it's just a matter of how, to, we, and there's a lot of learning that from yeah. just the testing, which was the first phase of the pandemic. And now we're seeing more affordable. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because in the beginning, and certainly in still some cases now, there was a affordability issue. Yeah. But let's talk a little bit more about other examples of what you're, what you're, you know, how we're, closing the gap. Chuck, do you want to talk a little bit about the ADA's work? Absolutely. I mean, in, in, in terms of closing the gap, I mean, the ADA made a very intentional uh, decision in August of 2020 to launch Health Equity Now uh, because we know we needed to address these, you know, systemic issues uh, that were going on um, in this country. And so we actually came up with, uh, with, with five pillars, cure, cause, cuisine, care, and connect. And we also came up with um, a list of 10 Bill of Rights, uh, which really resembles around the social determinants of health. So access to the best, to the latest and greatest medical devices, access to insulin, access to uh, a healthy environment, uh, access to nutrition. And so, but we knew that we couldn't do it alone. I mean, you know, we had to make a really, really bold statement. Uh, but at the end of the day, we needed a partner. 
you know, that uh, would join on us. And, 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 you know, Abbott was one of the partners that actually stepped, stepped up as our anchor partner. And so uh, we have a partnership with them to, to seed along with the Helmsley Trust, which provided the sensors uh, in Columbus, Ohio, which is a, uh, in a predominantly underserved community, and we're partnering with a community partner called NCUS, and we're providing uh, patients living with diabetes in, in underserved communities with sensors to better track their sensors. health. Sensors. Sensors, mm -hmm. sensors. Yeah. Uh, to better track. Yeah, can you explain what a sensor does? A sensor, yes. Uh, or I'm happy. To well, you, <laughs> so, so so CGM continuous glucose monitor, but you can talk about that. No, 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 no. It's all great. So continuous glucose monitor for people with diabetes. Um, historically, they've had to um, uh, prick their fingers multiple times a day to track their blood sugar levels, and now it can be um, can be done with a, a sensor that's applied to the back of the arm. It's tracking your your uh, sugar levels 24/7. Um, and you can check that information on your on your phone. Talk about digital health and connected health, and it and it will actually alert you if sugars are going high or low, and that might help dictate what you do in terms of managing your care. So yeah. go on about what's happening in Columbus. And this <laughs> and, and 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 in Columbus, um, you know, we are are, are going to sign up 150 folks uh, with the sensors, and then we're going to track their health uh, over over a extended period of time. And then after that ends, we're going to track, but also use that data and those results to also do that in other underserved markets um, across the country. But when I think about the importance of Abbott being an anchor partner, um, it actually brought on two other partners. So we have Walmart, uh, we have Baxter, but their significant investment, we know that it takes three years to get to outcomes. And so we want partners that are in this partnership for the long haul, whether it be the next three years, the next 20 years. And so we know uh, that we'll be able to make some form of transformational change over an X amount of period of time. So these sensors will help with adoption yes. for people having it much, much more uh, fits in with people's lifestyle. Yeah. Better, unless we would hope after after this pilot that they would adapt better healthy lifestyles yeah. to allow them to thrive better yeah. 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 and make better decisions about their health. Yeah, and Sunak, tell us about, yeah. Yeah, and, and transitioning to the more community level, the direct patient care level, you know, we followed all the statistics on the economic toll and the morbidity and mortality toll, but the first and most important thing we did was we called all these patients that we've been supporting in the community for all these years and asked them what their needs were, what they were facing, and, and not really all that surprising, they were facing nutrition insecurity, they were facing economic challenges. And so as much as we had the ability to provide point of care glucose monitoring, that's not what they told us about. And so over the years, we've developed all these community groups where we provide microfinance support so they have access to loans. We've created agricultural cooperatives. And so when they told us the needs in the midst of COVID, instead of just focusing on COVID, which is what most healthcare providers do, people like me tend to do, what we said is, okay, we hear you. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna inject money into your microfinance groups and use the technology that's within, uh, the, I don't know how many of you have been to Kenya, but that's where phone-based banking started for the most part. And so we basically injected money into these microfinance groups and injected capital so they would have money to access loans. And for the more impoverished people in the group, what we actually did was we coordinated members to distribute their, the produce that they couldn't sell anymore to those other members. And we basically bought that produce so that the members who didn't have food could now have food. And so if you think about a disease like diabetes or hypertension or any of these chronic diseases, if your nutrition insecurity is bad, your management is bad. And so by doing these very basic, very obvious things, but they sound novel when in fact they're so simple and so obvious, and it really highlights how we as providers very rarely listen to patients. And that's the big key learning for us is the big gap that we addressed was we actually listened to patients and did exactly what they told us to do, and we did it and they did well. And so our patients <laughs> didn't, really, didn't really suffer too much from COVID compared to other populations. So the big learning is listen to what patients are telling you and do what they, what they tell you they want so that you can provide what you think yeah. they need. So treat the human, not the diagnosis. Exactly. Right. I also love the fact that you took learnings from what you saw in the field in Kenya to rural yeah. Indiana, yeah. which is the inverse of sort of what the way a lot of people think Yep. erroneously about the about the way innovation travels. That's yep. really yep. incredible. Yeah, and you do think about the inequities, how much you oftentimes think about global health in places like Kenya or in India. 
um, and that in the United States we've got it all figured out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Last time I checked, we do we, not. We, yeah. um, so there is yeah. there is work to be done there. Yeah. And uh, you know, once again, it unfortunately took a pandemic to really highlight the issues. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure everybody saw the news headlines of food pantries being overwhelmed in the midst of the pandemic. So I saw this and I went to the food pantry. And I started talking to patients, started finding out what was going on, and then the vaccine finally came out. And some of the people who were the least likely to reach real information, not misinformation, on the COVID vaccine were the people in those lines. And so similar to what we did in Kenya, where we go to patients, we set up groups and meet them where they are, we said, why don't we just do that in America? And so as there was limitations with COVID vaccination, especially for these populations, these long lines that were circling these food pantries, we basically started setting all of our students there, providing COVID vaccination education, and then giving vaccinations right there on the spot. Amazing. Basically taking the same exact model and theme that we used in Kenya, using it here, and over the course of a couple of months, we vaccinated over 2,000 people that probably wouldn't have gotten the vaccine. And the one big learning I had was, you know, a lot of us come in with preconceived notions that, you know, these low-income populations don't want the vaccine and they're flooded with misinformation and, you know, there, there's all this back. That wasn't the case at all. What it was is that when you're challenged with all these other priorities, so COVID led to economic challenges, you're struggling to get food, which is why you're in the food pantry line. That vaccination is not the top of your list. So most of the people we talked to weren't spouting off conspiracy theories. They were saying, yeah, I just haven't gotten around to getting the vaccine because I have to you know, work this job. And they are the frontline workers at a lot of the grocery stores and all the rest. And so by just making it simpler, making it easier, putting it in a place where they can actually access it without any judgment and just with complete ease, we were able to get vaccinations of people who wanted it without really much effort. It was a student-run project, and we partnered with Walmart, well, Walgreens on that, and it all worked. That's great. Well, you're raising important issues, too, about building trust yeah. with communities. And so let's talk a little bit about that. What are the, the trust barriers, particularly when we're talking about longstanding inequities and particularly communities of color and how we overcome those trust barriers? Well, I think, I mean, if, if you think about, you know, 50, 60 years ago when the Tuskegee experiment happened, you know, um, that, that's still in the minds of, uh, of our people of color. And so, you know, even, even with the wonderful CGM products, I mean, you know, it, you, know you, you have a hard time convincing someone that, that doesn't trust uh, the science or doesn't trust researchers to actually put a sensor on their body because they may think that Big Brother's watching and they can track them. And they can, so, you know, you have to kind of dial it back. But it's really important to get community partners that have the trust in the community community uh, that can work, help break down those barriers. But to your point, trust is still the number one issue. So how do you do that? Who are the, so in other words, it's not necessarily going to be the healthcare providers. It's going to be others in the community who have already gained the trust of, of members of the community. Like who? Like how do you, how does that, how do you begin to work build those relationships? So I would say um, a partner like, like NCUS in, in Columbus, I would say a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of the black churches um, yeah. in the communities, um, especially some of the bigger churches that, that have a congregation, 10, 12,000 folks uh, on a weekend, you know, really go, in, go into the churches because they trust the pastor. And so, you know, go and speak and have the pastor, you know, educate him about chronic diseases around diabetes or whatever the case would be, cancer, hypertension, whatever, you know, and, and, and get that trust and then slowly build that trust back and then introduce, uh, you know, things that, that will allow them to, to uh, thrive. Yeah, and I actually think it could even start earlier as I think about the role that we play along with, you know, healthcare providers, physicians, is on clinical trials. Hmm. Um, yeah. And just thinking about how we're designing clinical trials to be representative right. of right. those people who need our therapies the most. Um, and that also plays into trust, right? So if yeah. you weren't, if you're, you know, whether it be your gender or your race or your, your cultural, you know, ethnicity, whatever it ends up being, if you weren't sort of part of that trial or the people who are running the trial don't look and talk like you, that's going to be an impediment yeah. Yeah. Um, in, terms of, in terms of really believing. And so that's been an effort that we've really um, taken to heart in terms of making investments there, whether it be you know, educating and, 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 and you know, found, um, you know, funding scholarships for, uh, for, for people who will, of, of diverse, um, uh, um, you know, whether it be race, ethnicity, et cetera, 
um, to, to, fu to fund them because they will be the trialists of the future, yeah. right? And so it can't be in the kind of ivory tower academic centers where we often do our research. Um, we really need to be thinking differently to get into the community because right. I think that will help break down a really important barrier of trust. And, and clinical trials are really the foundation of modern medicine. So much of almost everything I do is, is based off of clinical trials. And I think that evidence is, is even more important yeah. moving forward. So all three of you are talking about being of the community rather than the notion of sort of parachuting in right. and saying we're here to help yeah yeah, yeah. no 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 we want to you need to be with yeah. us every step of yeah. the way yeah. so part of it is once we're there making sure we're getting the right community members involved but even earlier on when we're designing the product when we're doing the studies on the product yeah. kind of making sure we're meeting the needs of a broader community yeah yeah and, and even looking at this question at an even a broader ideological level you know, one of the things that was really jarring for me when I came from, after living in Kenya for over 12 years and then moving to the US, is when I looked around at society here, one of the things that was really striking to me was that as a society, we've grown to value populations that do less with more. And we really elevate those members of society. And if you look at past elections, that's evident in a lot of our elections. Whereas the thing that I really learned in Kenya was I developed an immense amount of respect for people who do more with less. Mm. You appreciate their resourcefulness, you appreciate their creativity. You also just appreciate just how few opportunities they have and how much they make of them. And so when I think about some of these inequities and the lack of trust, for the most part, in, the U in US society, even if you watch certain cable news networks, you'll see them demonize the poor, you'll see them demonize certain ethnic groups and uh, racial groups. And why would, those, why would you ever expect those groups to trust you when you're constantly disrespecting them and treating them like they're less than. And so this, this bigger thing that I would implore everybody here to do is think about these populations that do more with less. And, and keep in mind, I am not considering myself to be part of that. I, I look at them with complete reverence. I'm part of this less with more population. So I'm not, I'm not throwing stones at other people. I'm pointing the finger at myself. And I just have immense respect for them. Uh, and so I would really implore people to really start looking at that. And, and just one more slight tangent when I come to conferences like this. I hear this term empowerment a lot. And it's one of my pet peeve terms because it creates this dynamic where I, if I say, as a speaker in front of all of you, I'm here to empower you with my knowledge. Doesn't that sound <laughs> weird to you? It already sets this power dynamic yeah. where I'm assuming that I'm more powerful to you yeah. and I'm going to distribute my power. Part of this re recalculating this trust is to flip it. The reality is, is that if I don't say stuff that's interesting to you, none of you guys are going to listen to me. So I need you guys to give me some privilege and some power to actually listen to me. So I, when I talk to local communities, when I talk to rural communities, they have all the power. I, I don't have any false assumptions about that. So even this term of empowerment, I want to flip it on its head. We need to get the power back from them and design our systems in such a way that we're actually seeking their support and their kind of mm. power to us to actually support systems that actually work for them. Because we haven't done that for far too long. Yeah, oh, that's really good. So whose who's responsibility is it? We've talked about, you know, we've, we've, we've established what the problems are. We've talked about some of the me measures that you all are taking to try to close these gaps, the role that inequity plays. So, you know, you represent, you know, um, a, 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 a farm, you know, a pharmaceutical company, you know, and, and then some, um, a civil society organization, academia, you know, we have the healthcare uh, community writ large, the population. How, whose responsibilities are they? Is it government? Is it private industry? Yes. Yes. I would say all, it's all those. I really do think health equity yeah. is a team sport, right? Yeah. That's the only way. There are so many stakeholders that we that we need to engage. So there's clearly a role that like an innovator company like an Abbott will play, right? In terms of making sure um, making sure the the products we developed are you know easy to use, they're accessible, they're affordable. Um, but that's just one piece of the equation. I mean, we need to partner, um, you know, with a, a variety of different folks um, to really make a to really make a difference. So, and what Chuck, role does the government? But before we come to it, what role does the government, uh, federal agencies, play here, or state? Yeah, I, I think critically. I think critically important. Um, you know, I think about you know we you know we work quite a bit with the FDA and CMS and and state level agencies, et cetera. And I think that's really important because they're oftentimes setting kind of the rules and and sort of you know the guardrails in terms of how we operate. Um, and I know um, you know what what is so encouraging is I'm hearing more and more the FDA, the CMS, and I'll just use those two examples because we're here in the United States today talking about the importance of health equity. 
and their recognition is that if we're developing products that don't get to the, all of those who um, have who, who would benefit, that's that's the value of you know the most important technologies will will get to the most people, right? And I think they're recognizing that sometimes a lot of things we do are more niche, right? And they're for specialized folks, and they're not impacting the masses. And so I think it's I think it's all of our responsibility. Yeah, I would I would echo uh, Lisa's point. I mean, I, I don't want to regurgitate exactly what what she said, but it's I mean it's 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 public private. It's um, everybody has to come together. I mean, if you think about diabetes, is putting 323 billion dollars of pressure on a healthcare system. You know, it's actually past the tipping point. I mean, it's a pandemic. If you think about, you know, 40 to 50 percent of our Medicare costs are going to chronic diseases. You know, um, you know that's going to only last for so long. And so we have to be bold. We have to continue to, to have uncomfortable conversations. We have to push the needle. But it's going to take everybody uh, to solve this. You know, because when I hear about the complexities and this is complex, it's not complex. At the end of the day, a lot of people are making a lot of money. And so some people will have to take some haircuts to, to fix this problem. Yeah. yeah, and just a comment on the government. I, I, I was trying to avoid this because I've been pretty angry all day and I've been very cynical. <laughs> okay, go for it. <laughs> but, but kind of the, the kind of thing that I'm coming to here is that the government plays the role that we demand of them. And for the most part, as a U.S. society, I, I've lived in countries all over the world, we don't even treat healthcare as a right. And so as a society, before we point fingers at just the government or farmer or anybody else, we as a society have decided that healthcare is not a right in this country. Right. And, I, and, and I do lectures in Kenya, I do lectures in India, and I talk to people about this and like, wait, 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 you're telling me in America, healthcare is not a right? Like it's <laughs> entrenched in their constitution. And we don't have that entrenched. And so we can point fingers at government, but government's supposed to do what we're demanding of them. And we haven't made that a big enough sink. I mean, the Affordable Care Act which was a step to try to rectify that, and that was a campaign strategy. Like, repealing the Affordable Care Act was a campaign strategy that worked. So before we point fingers, we have to look at ourselves. And even just sitting in this conference, sitting in this room, we all have immense privilege. And once again, I'm including myself in all of this. And so we all have a choice of what we do with our privilege, whether we're sitting in pharma, whether we're sitting in academia, whether we're sitting at the ADA, what we do with this privilege, and even as individuals. And so basically the two choices we have are do we try to create opportunities for others to have the same privileges that we all enjoy? Because if we're sitting in this room in Aspen, we must have had some privileges along the way. <laughs> or what we frequently see is that we spend our time and effort to entrench those privileges for ourselves. And the more time we spend on that, and the less time we spend on creating privileges that, for others, that's basically the, the crux of the issue. So as much as it's easy to point fingers at others, if we're not doing those things to increase privilege for others, then we don't have any business pointing fingers. And, and I, I really implore everybody to demand of government what we're talking about here. Because we can sit around here and talk about it all day, but if our votes don't match, if the public and the community is not educated enough to know that the government's not actually responding to what we want, which I think is on display today, I, I think it's our fault as well for having a democracy that doesn't really respond to what we want. Okay. We're Amen, like brother. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the fact that, as you point out, healthcare is not enshrined as a right means that all of you and all kinds of other people, the people in the audience, people in the healthcare, every aspect of the healthcare profession have to sort of step up to fill that gap and work together, which can be a little chaotic. Yeah. So we talk about it's everybody's responsibility, but figuring out how to stitch together all these different organizations and groups, private and public, to solve problems is challenging. Yeah, it's Even challenging, and I would say it is complex, but it's doable, right? And so, and I do feel like there's enough like-minded organizations, mm -hmm. like-minded mm -hmm. individuals, that now is our time to really make a difference. And I feel like we own that responsibility as industry. I think uh, you kind of grow across the board. And as I said before, I'm actually encouraged by some of the work that some of uh, happening in DC in terms of they as, as well realizing that we have a broken system and we need to fix it. Yeah. yeah. As we, you know, we're going to move to questions in a few minutes, so please get your questions ready and we'll run around with mics. But I want to just ask, and, you know, Sunak, you gave a very moving, made, made some very moving statements about what, you know, what does good look like, which is sort of my, my round of questions, next round of, last round of questions I really want to ask you. You've described sort of a vision of what the way things should be. Will they be? Uh, <laughs> I'm skeptical, but how should they be? So what is, so let me ask, 
you, you know, and you, I'll come back to you again sure. last because I'm sure you have more to say about it. What does good look like and what are you doing, you know, at the ADA, at Abbott, and in your work, Sunak, to, to drive towards that? So I would say what, what good looks like from an ADA perspective is just, you know, all people living with diabetes have the rights to health care like everybody else, whether you have privilege, whether you don't have privilege, just everybody has a right. And so what the ADA is doing is I'll go back to our Health Equity Now initiative. I mean, we are being bold. Um, we know that uh, some of the things that we're trying to do um, have never been, been done before, but we also need like-minded partners like an Abbott that's actually stepping up to the table that actually want to make some transformative change. And, and get the resources and the tools from a technology standpoint in the hands of people um, that really need them. So I'll comment on the sort of what does good look like for Abbott. And our goal, which we've stated publicly, is that by 2030, we would like our technologies to impact the lives of um, one out of three people on this earth. So three billion people. Um, really wanting to make sure that we're, you know, helping improve the quality of life, letting people live their best lives. Um, so that is a big, bold goal. Um, and the only way we're going to be able to do that is changing the way in which we innovate and changing the way in which we partner with those who are delivering care. So on the innovation, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, so tell us. Yeah, so on the, the innovation thing. side, it's really thinking about, we've actually changed kind of how we're approaching innovation. And it's, I sort of put it into kind of three Ds. I like to keep things simple. It's it's the decentralized, democratize, and, and digitize. So we've already talked about decentralization here, right? You know, getting care to where it's needed, meeting people where they are in their homes. Um, democratization is, is making things so, a lot of people can do it around the globe, right? It doesn't have to be in specialized centers in, in Purdue or UCSF or, um, you know, in London. Let's make, you know, technologies that can be deployed to the masses. And then digitization is all about taking the mass quantities of data that we have in, uh, in healthcare and really changing that data into information and ultimately actionable insights. And really getting that sort of, and I, I, maybe I shouldn't use the word empower, because um, I like to think about empowering consumers, but maybe it's engaging consumers in their own health. So I'm a quick learner here. Thank you, Sona. <laughs> um, it's really engaging consumers in their own health and getting the information they need so we can manage it. And who's, who's, who's going to care more about your health than, than you? And so I think that's a challenge for all of us is how do, how do we do that in, in a way that, um, that sort of meets people where they are? And then on the partnering side, I think once again, like we're saying it's, hey, it's one thing to have this great technology, um, but we need to make sure it's adopted around the globe. So that's working with you know, agencies around the, around the world in terms of ensuring people have access, ensuring physicians are trained, ensuring um, consumers know how to utilize the technology, getting technology <laughs> that you know, enables them to you know, manage it from a remote location. Because you can't always take time out of work and come into a big mm -hmm. urban center and get um, you know, being seen by a care provider. Sometimes we need to kind of flip it on its side and, and meet people where they are. Yeah. And I'm, I'm heading back to Kenya tomorrow. So if anybody wants to see what good looks like, you're welcome to join me. And I can, <laughs> I can show you what our model looks like. And the, the key thing that I would really emphasize is that that takes a lot of partners to make it happen. So the, kind of the signature population health model that we have is a program called Big Pick, which is bridging income generation through group integrated care. So this basically responds to all the things that patients for years have been telling us that they need. They need access to loans so they don't lose all their money when a crisis happens. And so we created microfinance groups. So we create microfinance groups of 20 to 30 people. And then the next thing we do is we incorporate education into that. And then the next thing after that is after we provide the things that they really want and actually create agricultural cooperatives that kind of mobilize them to get more returns on their agricultural activities, we then integrate clinical care. And so when I talk about partnership, fortunately we have a partnership with Abbott where we get point of care supplies that we can actually bring directly to the most rural and remote places in Kenya. An example of decentralization right exactly. there. <laughs> and so when they have their group meetings to do microfinance, which they all wanna do because they all use it for loans and it's their own informal banking system, we bring our clinicians with us. So instead of having 30 people pay five, five dollars or, or spend three to five hours to get to our clinic, we, ex we basically go out to them. And so we now have point of care technology that makes that kind of care possible. And so what actually happens is that all of their care outcomes improve. 
And so their blood pressure goes down, their retention in care, their linkage to care, all these things improve. And it's so obvious, but it's so infrequently happening here. So what, when you ask me what care looks like in the future here, it's helping, Kenya. yeah, <laughs> it's, it's basically helping health system realize that if you're only focusing on clinical care, data is pretty clear in showing that you can only impact 20% of their health outcomes. That whole other 80%, you're basically leaving on the table. And if that's the kind of clinician you wanna be, we're never gonna work well together. So the big change that, that has to happen is that we as healthcare providers, as healthcare systems, are there to respond to people and communities, not just to patients. Because if you're only responding to their clinical needs, you're not gonna deal with them as a person, you're only gonna do that. And, and there's so many stories I could tell where you know, a patient tells me they just lost their job and I see that their blood pressure has gone up. So the clinician that I was 20 years ago before going to Kenya, before thinking about social determinants of health and all these issues, would have been, oh, your blood pressure's up, I need to add another medicine. But if they just lost their job and they can't pay for it, chances are they're gonna stop everything. And so what I've really learned to do is to treat people as people and interact with them. And I can tell for any provider who feels burnt out, when you have patients who you know as people, care becomes so much more fun because you're actually part of their community. Um, and that's what the future looks like for me. And incorporating technology into that to make care more convenient for people, that, that's what we need to do because most of our clinics are open during the day for hourly workers who would basically lose a whole day's worth of wages. Whereas for salaried workers, it doesn't make a difference. And so our systems are all built around other populations, but yet we're trying to force fit low income populations, uh, underserved populations into this model that doesn't work for them. So the future looks to me like we have to intentionally build models, which we've successfully done in Kenya, and I'm hopefully going to be able to do in Indiana as I spend more time here. Great, all right, we're gonna take your questions now. Okay, let's uh, start right there in the back and then we'll come to, come to you. And if you could say your name, and if you feel comfortable doing so, your affiliation. Sure. Um, so my name is Deepak Vashisht. I'm from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in upstate New York. So, so hearing the panel, is it like a fair assessment that based on, on, on the discussion, the future of healthcare in the country looks like handheld healthcare provider, where everything is coming through the phone, and you're looking at where to go if you have diabetes, where to go and buy food from? Um, public policies are dictated by the data which is being generated uh, through the phone. I mean, I, I'm sort of wanting a clarification a little bit at a loss as to what will be the future. I don't know if you- And the role of technology. You and the role of technology that be like impersonal from the point of just my phone is gonna yeah. tell me everything. <laughs> I'll respond quickly. Like that's the exact counter of yeah. what our model is, like our model is super personal and we leverage technology to do that. So to kind of respond directly, the model to me looks like when you go to a health system or a health provider, that they're not just gonna focus on the diabetes numbers or continuous glucose monitoring, they're gonna look at your nutrition, they're gonna provide you with services that help address that. And even what we're doing in Indiana already is we're using technology to find all the service providers who live near a patient who provide whether it's housing, financial resources, nutrition resources, and link the patient directly to that. So to me, the future of healthcare is going to, be going to hopefully be built more around what patients need and what they're telling us they want, rather than what a computer is telling us. Because the computer can't always capture that, but we're actually trying to build computers that can capture that and link services to it. But none of that happens if that patient doesn't trust us enough to actually even engage us. Because they're never gonna tell us about those other needs unless they trust us enough. So that, that personal connection can never really go away. And even if it's over video, that's fine. But there has to be that trust and personal connection. Yeah. And I do think the personalized medicine, and as I think about our technologies, thinking about how can I learn sort of the language of your body, right? Can I use sensors so I understand what's happening holistically? It could be your blood sugar levels, it could be your blood pressure, it could be a lot of different things. That then I could say, hey, based on this combination of things, based on maybe what I've seen your phone do, you've gone, you know, you haven't moved in a day or two or, or a month, you know, maybe there's need for intervention. So to the extent that we could put sort of predictive analytics and AI on there, I do think there's an application there for the technology, but I'm wholeheartedly believe it ultimately needs to be a really strong connection between a yeah. care provider and a and a consumer so it's a tool but not a replacement yeah absolutely yeah. okay i think that just uh here in the second to last ideally we 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 have the tools we're, we're helping we're giving tools to providers so they can actually spend more time with their patients versus yeah. more time running tests exactly. and documenting yep. 
Hi, my name is Vivian with the Sonia Nebetta Foundation out of New York. Um, the future looks bright. I'm glad about you know that question of what good looks like. So, um, my question, I guess, is for Lisa, um, and maybe Sonic can uh, speak about it as well. Um, Abbott, you uh, around the COVID testing. I mean, you innovated a lot, and then these at-home tests that you spoke about, and they're pretty available and accessible here in the United States. But how did you think about that in terms of? global access, because I know um, probably Sonia can speak about this too. In Kenya, access to these um, tools is next to impossible and still pretty um, inaccessible. So how did you think about that? And what does yeah, the Yeah, and so we do have, that? that's a great question. We do have a, uh, another platform that's actually, um, that's actually distributed outside of the US, um, which is actually even a lower cost, still accurate. Um, and the goal there is being able to, to distribute it. The trick there is always with the distribution, right? And sort of working generally best is working with local governments on the distribution. Um, um, and so that's where we've, um, you know, in the US, obviously, it kind of went through more of a, the retail system and, and then ultimately came through the governments. But that was a delayed response. Um, and uh, so that is something we're continuing to work, work towards. And I know we've made progress, but there's more progress to be done. Yeah, and I'll just make a quick comment. I mean, there's lots of challenges with bringing the cost down and making it accessible. But the other thing I want to factor in as you start to do this is that we, we spent years building this home glucose monitoring program. And one of the biggest things is that we had to figure out a way to incorporate that into a system. And if you look at the public sector healthcare models in, in most um, countries that I, I work in, the clinical visit is like five minutes. And so if you're expecting a clinician who's supposed to see anywhere between 50 to 100 patients in a day to then digest this whole diary of home glucose monitoring readings, it's simply not gonna happen. So what we did was we built a whole model where we have community health workers and basically peers who've had diabetes before and were successful with home glucose monitoring call up all the patients who are enrolled in this program basically once a week, get all their results. We, we have a system where it puts it into a graph and even puts in comments to explain the results. Like it's very personal. Um, and so then once you have that summary, then we give that summary to the provider. We make insulin dosage adjustments once a week. And we've seen rapidly that we can improve uh, glycemic control and get patient, patients A1Cs down. But it's not just as simple as increasing access. There's all these other pieces that need to be, be built in to maximize the outcomes of it. Next question we have over here. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Monica Wendell. I'm a professor at the University of Louisville. Um, so I appreciated, well, all of it, but talking about you know re the recognition that there's a broken system and that happening at higher levels of control. Um, and I would kind of argue with that because the system's doing exactly what it was designed to do. And for the people who have control, it's working great. Yep. And so as you're talking about the need for trust, um, like I love all the grass grassroots pieces of that because that's part of what I do. But I'm curious, and I'm not sure that I can articulate the question really well, but I think you'll know what I'm saying. I'm curious how you're thinking about, okay, we, we have these technologies or we're developing these yeah. technologies um, that can be accessible, but there's a very small, powerful group of people who really determine whether it's accessible or not, who don't really have a whole lot of motivation for it to yeah. be accessible. And Do you mean in private industry, or are you talking about? I'm talking about, well, I'm talking about government. Go yeah, I think okay. I mean, our healthcare incentive system is, yeah. is broken. Right. If you think about it that way, because, you know, honestly, the least expensive encounter, you know, least expensive patient is a patient who, who passes away, right? You know, like it's, you're going to consume right. less resources if you pass away at age 50 versus age 90. Like, that's just a fact. Right. So you're right. Like, the incentives are, you know, can be, you know, but then the sometimes they're upside down. Then the other piece of that that I'm curious about, especially after this morning's devastating news, is how are y'all thinking about the possibility of the government or or different levels of government using the data that are captured through those technologies to criminalize behavior? Because that, like, the way we're going, that seems like a huge threat. I think just speaks to, for all of us, is the need for advocacy, yeah. right? So if there's ever a time to use your voice, now is the time. Um, yeah. 
and certainly this is something I can just speak yeah. and chime in on that because we do a lot of work on that too. Um, this is something that the data that the tech companies that collect that data are looking at, and there's going to be there's 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 a great deal of attention to this because we all leave digital breadcrumbs when we're searching on Google or when we're you know and we're moving around or using GPS, visiting you know clinics. And so it's it it's it's a big it's a big issue. I don't know that. And one that I think we all take very seriously, yeah, but yeah. it's something we have to re revisit and continue yeah. to commit and make sure people know that, you know, what is your data? What rights do you have yeah. as a consumer of of healthcare? And and making sure when it makes yeah. sense for it to be exercising those rights, right? Yeah. Like so, d making sure you're asking the, those questions, which it seems like you are. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, you're saying how I feel, so I would just say yeah. drop the mic. But you know, and and, and what <laughs> what the reality is is it doesn't feel like enough to me anymore to be able to impact the populations I can directly impact. So I work with a large population in Kenya, but it doesn't feel like enough. I work with a population in Indiana, it doesn't feel like enough. And it's, you know, I'd like to hope that civil advocacy is the change that will make it happen, but I'm feeling pretty beat up today, as I'm sure many of you are. Yeah. Um, but I'd like to think there's hope that if we can band together and, and actually make these issues that we respond to, we can get progress, but it's an uphill battle. And it's not enough to sit in rooms like this and talk about it, we've got to go out and do it. And, and while, you know, while we're sitting here, there's been people who've been fighting to get exactly what they want, and they got exactly what they want. So as smart as we all think we are, we're not fighting very smart because we're losing. So to me, the big message is fight smarter. All right, well, I hate to end on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, fight smarter is a good note to, uh, exactly. to, to end on. So we'll, 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 we'll uplift a little bit here at the end. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you to the audience. Yeah. And, uh, We'll see you soon.